Thank you, Heather. Uh, as Heather mentioned, today we'll be looking at the results of our 2018 salary guides. Try to do our best to focus on the IT or technology side of this, but uh, a lot of it is going to be kind of all encompassing look at the employment market uh, within Canada. Uh, my name is Travis O'Rourke, and I look after our kind of our outsourced recruitment business today, but uh, my entire background is in IT recruitment uh, in some way or shape. I've worked across all provinces in Canada and uh, both permanent and contract, a pretty good, uh, decent blended experience on that side. Um, 2018 salary guide, the, it's our eighth guide, and it gives us uh, a lot of data for comparison. Uh, so this year, about 3,500 people took the survey, uh, pretty much in line with previous years. Uh, and the report that we've put out is going to cover 12 different industries and functions. Uh, so there's a lot of insights in there, regardless of what organization or, or sector that you're from. Uh, you'll find information on competitive uh, compensation, benefits, recruitment trends, retention trends, uh, and then it always we add a little bit of an analysis and make some recommendations uh, based on the labor market as well. So uh, starting at the top, we saw a big uplift in economic confidence and business activity kind of as a whole in 2017. Now this chart shows economic expectations. So in dark blue, that's the proportion of people who said the economy would strengthen in the year to come. And you can see there was a big drop after the 2014 oil and gas downturn. This is where the line of people who are optimistic almost touches the gray line. And this is people saying the economy would weaken. So in the last three years, we've seen steady improvement. And this year, there are more people saying the economy will strengthen than there are saying that it will stay the same, which is great. Then, if you take a look at how that affects business activity, almost two-thirds of employers say business activity increased in 2017, which is up from 51% in 2016. Uh, looking ahead, 70% say activity will increase again next year, which is great to see. Canadian employers are optimistic, they have big plans, and everything is looking up. So we'll look a little bit closer and make sure the same can be said for all of IT. This is more of a kind of a national all employment outlook. Looking at the same question, but the IT specific results, the circle graph on the left there shows the economic outlook. So 46% of IT employers say the economy is strengthening, which is the same level as we saw nationwide. So no changes just yet. And when we look at business activity, let me just get a click here, IT respondents report higher growth than average in 2017 and pretty much comparable expectations for next year. So you're likely to be busy in 2018 as far as an IT business activity standpoint, but how does that translate into actual hiring? Um, starting with mm -hmm. national permanent IT hiring, uh, this chart shows headcount increases, predicted increases. So light blue is what employers said they would do, and dark blue is what they actually did. Uh, most of the time, employers are pretty close to their prediction, if not just a little below. But this year, headcount increases slightly outpaced expectations. This is a sign of how busy employers were. Next year, the prediction is higher than we've seen since, 27, since, since 2013. Employers are prepared, at least, at least it appears, for a lot more growth. Uh, but for me, the real story here is contingent workers or contractors. So again, in light blue is what employers said they would do, and in dark blue is what they actually did. In 2017, you can see contingent staffing levels increased by more than double the expectation. Now that's a huge jump, obviously, and it tells me that people do not realize how many people would need to achieve their business goals. Contingent workers are a great resource for sudden or short-term staff needs, but it's also obviously very prevalent in IT. This is an efficient and a cost-effective way to make sure you always have the right resources at the right time. However, there are, of course, additional risks from regulations around temp and contract workers, uh, specifically in Ontario now with Bill 148. 
So my concern is that some employers might not have the processes in place to protect their organizations against those risks. Um, specifically on Bill 148 in Ontario, when we look at the reverse onus changes coming in as an independent contractor, at Hayes, we're doing a lot of workforce assessments for our clients right now, uh, and you'd be amazed at how many employers have challenges with their temporary or contract worker and classification. Um, we found them listed as office supplies on different budgets. We've seen them hidden in the finance department. Um, and we've had to tell HR that their estimate for the number of temps on site is usually about triple than what you think. So our best advice, bring your HR, your legal, your finance, procurement, all your stakeholders, get them together and make sure you're on top of all these risks. Because next year, another 26% of employers said they'll increase their contingent staffing levels. This is two big increases in a row. And as we're seeing the makeup of a workforce gradually shift from all permanent to the kind of Uber-style shared job, it's very, very important that you're aware who is on your site, what they have access to, and where the right checks and balances in place for those workers. Um, so with business activity heading up, hiring activities heading up, uh, and what does this look like for uh, kind of IT and technology? Um, IT full-time hiring was much higher than average, and next year more than half of companies planning to increase headcount, and that's huge, especially considering the ongoing skill shortage, and we'll discuss that shortly. Uh, looking at temporary staffing, uh, once again the use of contingent workers was high in 2017, and while expectations for increases do trail off going forward, it's still higher than the national jump. Uh, so national hiring is up, and in IT we're seeing an even bigger jump. Uh, so we'll take a look at what that means and how that translates uh, into actual compensation. Uh, well, nationally, salaries aren't really moving. If you look at this chart, uh, this is the number of employers increasing salaries each year. In dark blue is the number of salaries that are increasing by less than 3%, and in light blue are those increasing by more than 3%. Uh, the trend line, since 2012, the number of employers increasing salaries by more than 3% has dropped by half. Now, the way we see it, increases by 3% are really just cost of living increases. It's incremental, and it's important to keep up with the cost of living, but it's not an actual material increase. And the trend does seem to be a concern for a lot of Canadians, because if we look at the top results, 41% of employers say they're not they don't believe employees are being paid at the right market rate. And this has increased from 32% last year. That's a pretty big jump. We've got 40% of managers saying they've increased one-off salary offerings in order to secure the right person. So HR is setting the salary bands, but managers are ignoring them when they feel it's not, it's not necessary to get the actual right talent. Um, HR is also worried about salary. Uh, they told us their biggest competition for talent comes from the companies that can pay more. Probably not that surprising. Uh, and we're seeing this trend across the board. Um, it does look like that we're nearing a tipping point because 41% of HR leaders say they have either changed or will change their compensation plans in order to attract the right talent. And that's up from just 25% last year. So almost half of companies are changing comp plans to attract talent. It might be time for you to take a look uh, inside your organization and see if you're making the same move. A uh, quick look at IT plans. This is comparing how salaries changed last year with what employers expect next year. Uh, IT were less likely than average to increase salaries at all. Uh, one third saying compensation plans stayed the same and uh, less than a quarter saying it's going to increase by more than 3%. However, looking forward, employers do expect to increase salaries next year, and that's with one-third increasing by more than 3%, and that's good news, although it does mean that two-thirds are not increasing salaries or they're just going kind of by that marginal cost of living, less than 3% increase. Um, if we were an employer's market with lots of available talent and tons of IT people at work, then that might be fine. Um, but as you now know, um, the, the IT employment market across Canada is extremely tight. A worker can typically um, put out their resume and end up with uh, multiple offers after a month or so. 
Okay, so we've got 70% of IT employers say the industry has a skills shortage. And that's on par with the national response, which surprises me a bit since I think IT employers would agree that the sector has much more of a severe talent shortage, uh, particularly in some areas. Um, and of course, that skill shortage negatively affects business. 57% uh, of employers say the skill shortage is negatively affecting their revenue. So more than half of companies say that this shortage is directly affecting their bottom line. You'd think that would be enough to do something about it. Uh, you'll also see that half say that the skill shortage is causing increased overtime. So employers are having to pay more to their existing teams to make sure they get projects done on time. But what exactly is causing the shortage? We'll take a, a closer look. Um, I think what we're seeing is some interesting changes. And we'll start by looking at how these responses changed from last year. Uh, the number one reason was still lack of training and development, and that number has increased. So then behind that, we'll see people are leaving for a different industry, which is interesting, and may indicate that IT workers are so confident in the market that they feel they can be successful in another industry rather than staying in their current sector. So again, you're going to see oil and gas IT workers moving over to finance. Uh, the number of people relocating has decreased, but it's still double the national average once all of their skill sets are, are brought in. Uh, there's, no, there's so much competition kind of nationwide that we're seeing a lot of mobility for IT people. And it can be a huge career booster if you're willing to make the move to go where the jobs are. Um, not as many employers say that, few, that fewer people entering the job market are actually the reason for the shortage. Again, training and development is going to be uh, at the top of that list. Uh, but really, the big issue is that at least in my opinion, there's a lot of new technologies that are coming in, and they're relatively new or rare, and there's just not enough education available to develop the IT professionals that Canada needs. Um, IT employers are, are much more likely to say that this is the, the norm as, as compared to other sectors. In fact, it's about 50% higher than average. Uh, the only way to address this, in our opinion, is through better connections between schools and employers. Better employer-led education programs, or, or maybe the answer is in immigration uh, for skilled IT professionals. Uh, but until we really grapple with this problem, we're going to start seeing the same outcome year after year, which is difficulty in hiring and managers complaining about a skill shortage. Oh, looks like I clicked ahead a little earlier there, I apologize, but um, what this slide is looking at is that 86% of IT managers are saying they struggle to hire. And that's higher than the national average, and really that's the number one reason is the shortage of good applications. From our research into what candidates are looking for, we know that at any given time, less than one in 10 are actively job hunting. However, nine out of 10 would leave their job for the right offer. And that's a 15% increase since 2013, so more candidates are open to moving for jobs. And that indicates really a, a nice renewed confidence in the job market. Remember during the kind of the 08 to 2011 run, if you had a job, you kept that job and you held on to it. Um, so despite this willingness to move, if managers are still relying on just applications, they're missing out on the people who will be most interested in the job. Again, 90% of people are willing to take it, but only 10% are actually applying. So if you can put the right offer in someone, they're going to accept it. What you need to be doing is connecting with those candidates. You need to be finding and engaging with that audience so that when you do have an open position, you're not just relying on the people visiting job boards. If you're not making the right offer to the right person, obviously you're missing out on the top talent. Uh, and then on the other side of the coin, if you're not actively focusing on retaining your top employees, you're primed to be plucked from, from a competitor. Now that requires you to know what your people want and then you can focus on how to secure them. Uh, we surveyed thousands of candidates. Uh, and what we just asked them is in a job, what attracts them to take a new role? And we're seeing a lot of mismatches between what works to attract and to retain employees versus what employers are actually doing. 
So first, I want to take a look at some of the top line findings of employees' priorities, and then we'll look at some of the missteps, or at least what we see as missteps, that we think employers are making and perhaps what they can do to address this. So we'll look at employee and candidate priorities. Uh, at the top here is what attracts candidates to a role. So in the dark blue is salary, and then moving to the right, you have career growth, then culture, and then benefits. Now, if you compare that to the second chart, you can see that salary becomes less important when it comes to retention, while career and culture shift to become even more important. So the important takeaway when looking at these two charts is that while salary is the single biggest factor for both attraction and retention, it's actually outweighed by career growth and company culture when combined. Um, a second interesting finding from this data is that Canadians are more likely to say that they would take a pay cut for their ideal job than they would take a step back in seniority, which shows really the importance of, of kind of career progression. So you might have already spotted some of the mismatches between what you thought people wanted and what these results show, uh, but let's take a look in some detail and see if we can come up with some actions uh, for you to realign on your side. Uh, I'm going to go through five specific areas where we see room for improvement. Uh, you might be hitting it out of the park on some of these, but I'm sure there'll be a couple uh, that you recognize as an opportunity uh, to maybe make some corrections or improve your hiring and retention uh, as we head into 2018 here. Uh, first up, we've talked about salary. Easy. Everyone's worried about it. 47% uh, of IT employers say companies that pay more are their biggest competition for talent and only 43% of IT employees think they're being paid at a market rate, which is obviously very concerning. On top of that, almost half of managers are increasing salary offerings to secure a specific candidate. Now, that's a problem for a number of reasons. First of all, if you have a lot of managers doing it, it has a major impact on payroll or budget implications. And secondly, if they're paying more to get a specific person on their team, that might cause some discontent among your existing team members who haven't seen a significant pay increase in a number of years. And then finally, about one in 10 managers say they've increased their salary offerings for more than a quarter of their new hires. So some companies could be seeing a lot of hiring done with salaries that are well outside the norm on their team and likely outside of the norm of kind of a, a salary ban that HR might have set. So if some functions or regions are consistently changing these salaries for specific roles, it's probably a time to think we need to do an extensive review of all of our salaries. Um, and again, right now the data is showing when managers are only willing to increase by less than 3%, but 25% are paying more for outside hires, it looks like the best way to get a raise is to actually change employers. And that's really what's going to kill your retention. Um, moving back, 23% of employers are increasing salaries by 3%, and then less than half of actual HR are planning to review their compensation plans as a whole. So everyone's worried about salary, but very few, specifically within HR, are willing to take a look at their salary banding in order to address that. Um, definitely concerning stats to look at. Okay, uh, it's important that you're at least meeting market expectations. Probably self-explanatory, but let's see how you can do that. Uh, first, use all your resources to make sure you know what the market rate is. Um, refer to our salary guide, talk to your recruitment consultants, work with associations or other experts. To, you want to find out what other trends are happening in the market. Um, knowledge is definitely half the battle. If you find that some salaries are below market rate, we'd say put a plan in place to increase them. It doesn't have to be immediate. That's not always possible. Um, but just get a plan in place. And make sure you have something so that when you're talking to your employees, you can let them know it's on their radar. It's something that you'll be looking at down the line. Um, otherwise, it just looks like you don't care, and some salaries may lag well behind the market rate. And that's a really good way to disengage good employees. 
Up next, we'd encourage you to review your salary bands as new positions become open, especially if it's been a few years since you, you filled something in that skill space. Um, in many cases, you might find the salary range is still similar, but if you consistently review salaries when hiring, then you'll be able to keep up with all the market challenges. Um, finally, don't try and compete on just salary alone. Only one company can pay the most, and really it's other job factors that will set your company apart. Uh, benefits, let's take, let's take a look. That's another area that you can make, a, make, make some headway. Um, let's look at what employers think matters most for recruitment and intention. Uh, we asked HR professionals and, and IT managers specifically to rate the benefits that they thought were the most important, and on the left-hand side, you're going to see the top five. Now, these might look good to you. We hear a lot about flexible work and so on, uh, but it might surprise you to know that only one of these five is in the top five benefits for candidates, and only three are in their top ten. So what is it the candidates actually want? It's about personal and professional development. Two of the top five for candidates are training related. It doesn't even track, crack the top five for employers. And we did use the same lists for managers and candidates to kind of click from. Uh, so employers had as many training related options on their side, they just didn't see it was important. Pension and RRSP matching and bonuses are still important to IIT candidates but it looks like very few candidates are getting the training and development support they want. Uh, flexible work or work from home options, they're just not enough to outweigh that thirst for new knowledge and development. I mean, it's very difficult to open a paper or a magazine or a website today and not hear about AI and robots coming in to take our jobs. And constantly upskilling yourself and learning new tech, it's on the forefront of everyone's minds. And, and it's, uh, it's about time that employers started to address it. Uh, but we'll leave this slide. I'm sure you noticed that health, dental, and extra vacation aren't on the lists above. Uh, more than two-thirds of employers offer these benefits, so at this time we're kind of seeing these as kind of stable across the board. They're not a differentiator in the market. Um, so if you're, if you're not offering these, you should, but uh, again, it's past the differentiator stage. So what can you do to kind of better align with market expectations? Uh, my first stop would always be talk to your employees. What do they want? A simple survey. Send it out company-wide. Make it anonymous uh, and help them with their insights. Help you gather their insights so that you can prioritize the areas where there's the most dissatisfaction um, and focus on the biggest area that you need to push for the change. Again, I suggest using all of your resources to determine what market expectations or candidate priorities are. Uh, the salary guide that we put out, it's on our website, you can get a hard copy as well. Uh, it's a good starting point. Um, our recruitment consultants, we talk to thousands of candidates a year in your industry, um, and they really have, I mean, pr pretty much uncomparable frontline knowledge to what these skilled professionals are looking for. Finally, uh, when you're making a change, prioritize those kind of most wanted benefits first. Uh, making a big deal about introducing free snacks won't help if all your employees really want time off in lieu. So find out what your employees want, find out what the market wants, and then work those into your plans. Um, as I said, 90% of people would leave their current job for the right job offer even those who are happy in their current role. Um, so what would make a happy employee accept an offer? The number one reason that a happy employee would consider a job offer is for career progression. It's the second most important aspect when someone's weighing a job offer, and it's the biggest pull factor that you'd have to try and use to bring in a candidate who didn't think they were job hunting until they got your message about a job opening. Um, however, 42% of employers are promoting career progression to attract top talent. It's one of the lowest on the list. So if you're not telling your candidates about the career opportunities, they don't think they're interested in your jobs, even if it would be a good fit. Um, so career progression is obviously an opportunity at almost every company. You need to work that into your recruitment strategy. Um, this is, these are kind of on the right-hand side here, the top five factors uh, contributing to career growth, at least according to Canadian workers. Uh, some of those might fit 
what you thought people wanted. And those are training courses, maybe it's internal job opportunities. Uh, but a lot of candidates are looking for the right technology. They want recognition, variety in projects. Uh, so think about whether you're supporting people across these areas when you actually think about career growth. Career growth isn't just about job titles and promotions. Um, it's actually just about increasing responsibilities or, or helping them learn new skills, giving them internal recognition. Um, these are all very, very important parts of career progression and to be honest, they're, they're quite often overlooked. So when you're trying to attract the best and the brightest, emphasize the career opportunities that are available down the line. It's the main reason that ambitious people leave their jobs. And I think a lot of employers are put off by the idea of career growth because they think it's about a focus on promotions and salary increases and no, you need to be happy in your current role. But think beyond those tired cliches because that's not what most people are looking for when they talk about progression. Most people are looking for genuine opportunities to just learn new things and increase their own day-to-day -day responsibility. And to that end, introduce programs. Look at programs on mentorship or job shadowing. Uh, just lunch and learns to make the most of the existing resources in your organization. And this will have two benefits. One, you're offering the professional development that people are looking for. And two, you're keeping that knowledge in your organization and sharing it. You're making sure it's passed on to your future company leaders. That way if somebody does leave, you've been able to retain a lot of that very, very valuable knowledge. Uh, finally, target the candidates that you're looking for. Career growth is most important to junior and intermediate candidates, many of whom are Gen Y. So in advertising for these types of roles, it's especially important to emphasize the career growth opportunities uh, that your organization has. Uh, people rate culture as more important for staying in a job than for evaluating an offer. So again, culture more important to stay in the job than when you're looking at a new offer. It's a really important retention tool. Um, what's more, when people say they are unhappy in their current role, they list company culture as the number one reason they would consider an, another job. And that makes sense. If it's not a good cultural fit, then that is likely going to make them unhappy at work and that motivates them to look for another job or opportunity and uh, call companies like Hayes. Uh, career is the biggest pull, but culture is the biggest push, if that makes sense. Hopefully, hopefully it does. Uh, so culture should be top of mind when it comes to retention, but only 20% of employers recognize culture as a retention challenge. The top concerns for employers when it comes to retention are salary and career growth. Both of those matter a lot. They're both big pull factors that can attract someone, so I'm not suggesting you lose sight of those. However, culture is the biggest push factor. And if you don't have a good culture, then your employees aren't going to stick around even if you have the salary and career options that they want. Uh, but what is good culture and how do you get it? Uh, focus on the core tenets of culture. Across all demographics, employees say the most important aspects of culture are open communication, strong leadership, and work-life balance. That is it. It's not about pool tables or beer fridges. Those things are nice but employees want to work somewhere where there is clear and open communication. They want strong company leadership that they can trust, and they want an employer that respects and recognizes their efforts at work. And their needs, their needs in their personal lives as well. That's very, very important. Work-life balance is thrown out uh, um, very often in conversation, but not very often in practice. Um, and these aspects are, are harder to achieve than some of the flashier pieces. But employees won't be swayed by superficial gimmicks like, I mean, foosball tables around the office if it's just covering up the fact that the company doesn't have a strong core. Um, I suggest surveying your employees about your culture. Um, Hayes has an annual survey that we take pretty seriously and every year we introduce changes based on the feedback. Uh, it makes sure that we always know what people in our business are prioritizing, what's working and what's not. And as the demographics of our business change, we're able to keep up with it. It's a crucial part of retention strategy, and uh, I must say it works. Uh, the last four points are really about what you do, what you offer, and what your work environment is like. 
But now I want to switch gears a little and, and talk about how you communicate, what you promote, and who is listening. Uh, because you can be the best employer in the world. You can offer all the right things, have an incredible career path, and if you don't tell anyone about it, then you'll struggle to attract people. Uh, a lot of employers say that they're promoting their company culture to attract talent. It's the number one approach this year, but I'm not sure that companies are actually getting this right. Managers tell us their biggest issue is in getting enough good quality applications. So to me, that's more of a network issue. You're either getting tons of poor quality applications, so you're reaching the wrong people, or you're not getting very many applications, which means you're not reaching enough people. And one third of IT leaders say the lack of a candidate network is a major recruitment challenge. So there's alignment there. And one third of professionals say that target candidates don't actually know who their company is. Everyone is promoting culture, but no one is reaching the right people. Uh, so who are you promoting your culture to exactly? Um, and then the results come along. Only 40% of employers have a defined employer value proposition. So two-thirds don't have any clearly defined messaging about why people should want to work for them. That means that you're promoting your culture with inconsistent and mixed messages, and then you're probably not talking to your candidates, or at least your target candidates, in the right way. Uh, so what can you do about it? First of all, I would encourage every employer, no matter how small, to take time and define your employer value proposition, your EVP. Uh, why should someone want to work for you? Uh, what do your comp um, current employees like? What actually sets you apart from your competitors or from the market? And this is a great exercise in defining your, your company culture. It helps for clarifying both your internal and your external messaging for recruitment and retention, both equally important. Uh, without an EVP, your target candidates are receiving mixed messages. Next, um, identify your target candidates and, and start by building a network and sharing relevant, timely content. This is the best way to engage with those candidates so that they know who you are and they know what you do. Then when it comes time to hire, you already have a pool of interested, engaged, qualified candidates. Uh, finally, develop an internal communication plan. Uh, you want all of your employees to know why they should stick with you what you offer, and what other employers don't. Uh, so regular internal communication will help keep people engaged, which will ideally and likely improve retention. So those are our key findings and recommendations. I'll briefly recap and then show you how you can take some action to uh, start some of these improvements, if you liked what we said at least. Um, okay, so what have we talked about today? Um, Confidence and business activity are increasing hiring, but compensation changes remain normal. Employers may be focusing on the wrong things for recruitment and retention. Compensation matters, but it's outweighed by culture and compensation, or culture kind of as a whole. And if you're not communicating about your programs, then you're missing an important attraction and retention tool. Um, and there's four things you can do today to better align with what your employees and your candidates want. Um, compare your team or your organization's salaries to the market rate. Uh, start by talking to recruitment consultants or maybe even just by reading our salary guide. Uh, find and engage with your target candidates instead of waiting and hoping that they're going to come to you when you have a need for them. You've got to be proactive with that. Uh, start a conversation with your employees about what they like and what they don't like at work so you can target the areas for improvement. And then lastly, grow your network, join a LinkedIn group, connect with associations, get referrals rolling, and start developing a content plan so you can really engage with those workers well before you have an open seat uh, or a vacancy that's on your team. All of these insights, um, they come from our latest salary guide and some of bits of our other research as well. It's all available on our website. Uh, the salary guide itself officially launches in January, but you can get an advanced copy by contacting your recruitment consultant or, or by emailing marketing at hayes.com. 
<laughs> you can visit hayes.ca slash resources and then you'll you'll find loads of our reports there. Again, presentation today is a, a bit of a compilation of a few different reports, but uh, primarily from our salary guide. Um, that's it for our messages. I, I do have a few minutes for questions right now, if anyone has any. Um, if not, great. Thanks, everyone, for your time. I'll just uh, quickly pop open the chat window here. Oh, it looks like yes. Everyone was having kind of the same audio challenge that I was having in my in my headset there. Um, no questions coming through as of yet. Just give it one more minute. Check at the top there in the chat window. Okay, what are the primary skills in demand for IT workers? To be honest, um, the primary skills in demand, I, I would say anything within development, development is key. More and more, I'm seeing infrastructure type roles uh, heading overseas, uh, but development, especially those who have kind of the soft skills, maybe a bit of a PM or BA flair to them as well. They're actually able to engage with the end users of their services. Um, that kind of full package developer is the most in-demand worker right now. Uh, we're starting to hear a lot on the marketplace about big data and um, companies kind of investing within different components of AI next year. T to be honest, it's a lot of talk right now at boardroom tables. I'm not seeing that flow down too, too much into the recruitment market. Uh, but again, having those core development technologies is only going to help you as, uh, as AI continues to evolve. Um, it looks like that is it for questions. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time. And I really appreciate you putting up with us for the first 10 minutes there as we rolled through some of those uh, audio issues. Visit Hayes.ca, talk to your consultant, and uh, we'll be able to get a salary guide in your hands. Thank you very much, and uh, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.